Welcome, and thanks for coming to Science Study Break. Um, we do these programs twice in the fall and twice in the spring, and so we appreciate your attendance this evening. Um, just, uh, you probably noticed that there are some people back there with the camera. There's some filming going on here, so by entering this room, here's the legalese. It's possible that uh, you will appear somewhere on the internet when this video does go up. So you're granting us the rights to have you, your image and your sound without restriction throughout the universe. We do have scenes from uh, several different movies, so just so that you know, some of the content here will be mature, and there will be some words that you don't hear on TV, although actually now you hear a lot of them on TV, but the words that you didn't used to hear on TV, so just so as you know, now you know. Okay. Okay. Um, and if that sort of content isn't for you, there's always Spurs games which are suitable for everybody. So. So you know that. Uh, the program is brought to you by the UT Libraries. Uh, we're based out of the Life Science Library, which is where I work. It's the beautifulest library that's over in the tower. And there's a whole bunch of, life si uh, of library, UT Library staffers here who help to make this program happen and the other programs that we've done this semester. And then, of course, we have our presenter, Dr. Bruce Porter from Computer Science, and we'll get to him in a minute. Okay. And then... Of course, there's good stuff with the Spurs, too, that, you know, gave us the energy and the strength to go on to do these programs. Uh, this program and the wonderful dinner that you're eating is generously supported by University Federal Credit Union. They've been uh, a friend of the Science Study Break program for several years now, and uh, we're very grateful for their support. So. Uh, the program is also brought to you by the letter Q and the number 335 which is a Library of Congress call number classification area where you can start to find stuff about artificial intelligence, including this book, uh, Super Intelligence, that just came out recently um, and that you might have seen in the news. We've been doing science study breaks since 2010, and we have an archive online where you can go and look up some of our past programs. Um, we've had things in all sorts of STEM realms. So for example, we had a Halloween program several years ago where we had someone who was a, an, a computational biologist who uh, came and talked about the epidemiology of a zombie outbreak in the five county central Texas area and how quickly they would devour all of their food supply and then starve. And so that was pretty interesting science. Um, and we've, had, we, we've had things on the movie Avatar, uh, we've had things on living and working in space. I wish we could get back with that person now that the Martian has come out. I bet we'd all like to talk about that again. So you might notice that you've got a little half sheet somewhere near you. If you've got ideas for either programs that you think we should address or topics that you would like to see us address or presenters that you would like us to invite to this program series, then please leave us that information on the half sheet. Okay. Um, if you want to look at these past programs, they're in uh, the library repository, Texas Scholar Works, so you can just search for Science Study Break and you'll find them in there. And now, I'm going to hand it over to our presenter, Dr. Bruce Porter. We're going to have a little brief station break while we exchange microphones. Rock and roll. Take it away. All right, let's go. I'm Bruce Porter. I'm a professor in computer science. I worked in the field of artificial intelligence since my PhD in that area in 1984, which I figure was a good year to get a PhD in AI. I started in machine learning. Uh, that field is now all the rage. Unfortunately, I left it about a, 15 years ago to work in a neighboring field of knowledge-based or intelligent systems. So that's been my background. We're going to see some great uh, movies here today that will hopefully get you all thinking about what a future state of intelligence, AI-enhanced society might be like. And uh, I'd, I'd like you to be thinking about the ways that uh, Hollywood comes to depict science and AI in particular. I'd like you to think about the impact of technology on your own lives and where you see technology going 
It's going very quickly. That's the one thing we're sure of. What direction? It's harder to say. I'd like you to think about whether this is a technology that, we, that should be feared. And if it is something to be feared, then how do we, as the currently dominant species, uh, control the, uh, the, the rollout of this new technology? So those are some of the things to think about. Let's see some movies. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone bewake my outcast state. Is it just words, tale? Or do you fathom the meaning? Is it not customary to request permission before entering an individual's quarters? I thought that we could talk this out, that I could try to persuade you. The memories and knowledge will remain intact, reduced to the mere facts of the events. The substance, the flavor of the moment could be lost. Take games of chance. Games of chance? Yes. I had read and absorbed every treatise and textbook on the subject and found myself well prepared for the experience. Yet, when I finally played poker, I discovered that the reality bore little resemblance to the rules. And the point being, that while I believe it is possible to download information contained in a positronic brain, I do not believe you have acquired the expertise necessary to preserve the essence of those experiences. There is an ineffable quality to memory, which I do not believe can survive your procedure. Ineffable quality. I'd rather we had done this together, but one way or the other, you are doing it. You're under my command. No, sir. I am not under yours, nor anyone else's command. I have resigned from Starfleet. Free will? We have it, I think. Do AIs deserve free will? Are they capable of free will? Why is it that Hollywood typically pre pre presents AIs as robots? Why are they humanoid? Any thoughts? Well, let's start with the easy one. Why humanoid? Is there something uniquely beneficial about the human form, about bi being bipedal? about standing roughly this height and so on. It's hard to build a, a human-like human robot. Why should we even bother? Yeah? I think just for realistic purposes, if they're using a human robot to interact with human beings, then it makes sense that they would have the same shape, because most of our tools are generated to be used by human beings. And also, if we're wanting to use them to create something for society, then we'd want them to create something that would match up with what our bodies are already are capable of doing. OK. All right, good thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and for Hollywood, it differentiates them from a regular computer or just a highly computer. Right, right. So Google's autonomous vehicle just doesn't do it for you. <laughs> it's the right shape. It's the right form for its purpose. Why humanoid? Uh, I think it's important to make them human because, you know, human beings interact using body language and facial expressions and things like that. Like they're, they're just a Okay, all right, good stuff, good answers. Free Will, do you guys know this movie? Okay, what's happening to data here? His memories are gonna be downloaded. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, sorry, say again. Why is he resigning? Right. What are they threatening to do to him? Okay, let's get back to free will. <laughs> Data has emotions. He expressed emotion in that clip, right? He feels offended. He feels threatened. He's worried. He's, he's uh, skeptical. Why emotions? Why build an AI that's emotional? That's the, it's hard work to build a, uh, an AI that's emotional. 
We don't know how to do it. Why should we try? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Okay, yeah, that sounds right. If you take away the emotion side of data, does he deserve free will? Right. Good thing. Good answer. So he may not deserve it and he may not desire it. Anybody else on that point? Yeah. Sorry, I, could you say that last part again? So I think of your, of your question. Right. Right. What do you all think? OK, well, let's come back to this free issue of free will when we've seen a few more clips. And maybe we've got our uh, thoughts together on where these AIs are going. OK, Roxanne. Jimmy and his argument was that good? Argus' presentation was devastating. It almost convinced me. Well, you've got the harder argument. By some admission, data is a machine. That's true. You're worried about what's going to happen to them. I've had to send people on far more dangerous missions. Then this should work out fine. Maddox could get lucky and create a whole army of data, all very valuable. Oh, yes, no doubt. He's proved his value to you. in ways that I cannot even begin to calculate. And now he's about to be ruled the property of Starfleet. That should increase his value. <laughs> in what way? Well, consider that in the history of many worlds, there have always been disposable creatures. They do the dirty work. They do the work that no one else wants to do because it's too difficult or too hazardous. And an army of data is all disposable. You don't have to think about their welfare. You don't think about how they feel. Whole generations of disposable people. You're talking about slavery. <laughs> I think that's a little harsh. I don't think that's a little harsh. I think that's the truth. That's the truth that we are obscure behind a comfortable, easy euphemism. Property. An army of disposable datas. The army, first of all, that's one of the cool things about computer science, isn't it? You build one widget, you can replicate it a million times at no cost not like engineering fields generally. Build one successful data, at no additional cost, you can have millions of them, countless numbers of them. Disposable? Well, the killer app right now in the field of robotics, the, the main area of application, is in uh, bomb, bomb disposal, dealing with nuclear plants. The whole idea is disposability. Does it bother you? Yeah. Um, no, it doesn't actually bother you. Why?
So when does it cross the line? When does a robot become sentient or, or not disposable? They don't even get close to the line for you. Right, right. Okay, and I think it get, for me it gets back to the issue of emotion. Data is emotional. And I think if you take that aspect away from data, you wouldn't be so concerned about them being turned off. But I don't know. Your results may vary. OK. How are we doing on time, Roxanne? OK, let's keep rolling. Oh, I see what you mean. Let's go to. Um, Let's go to the Ex Machina movies, okay. number four. Okay. Actually, let's do number three. Okay. Right. They're also good. Uh, Ex Machina, for those who came out a little late, remember I said there was going to be some mature content, there was going to be some words. Okay? This is where it is. Yay. <laughs> so anyway, surely now is when you tell me if Ava passed or failed. Right. Right. Are you gonna keep me in suspense? No, no. Her uh, her AI is beyond doubt. Is it? She passed. Yes. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. Although I gotta say I'm a bit surprised. I mean, did we ever get past the the chess problem, as you phrased it? As in, how do you know if a machine is expressing a real emotion or just simulating one? Does Ava actually like you or not? Although now that I think about it, there is a third option. Not whether she does or does not have the capacity to like you, but whether she's pretending to like you. Pretending to like you. Yeah. Well, why would she do that? Mm. Maybe if she thought of you as a means of escape. Roxanne, let's go on to number four. So if you can just, for a second, separate 
So the mad scientist creates a, uh, a robot in the form of a woman, brings in a naive young uh, uh, assistant there to assess whether the robot passes the Turing test. Do you all know the Turing test? Not enough people know the Turing test. Named, after, named for its creator, Alan Turing, who's often called the father of artificial intelligence, which is odd because he even predates computer science. So to be so visionary is to see not only computer, computers, but also their eventual evolution into AIs, almost inevitable in retrospect. Well, that's remarkable. This guy had true vision. Anyway, the Turing test uh, is a test to see whether or not an AI system is truly intelligent. And it's often called the, the replication game. It's whether uh, you as an interrogator of a human and a robot, unable to see these two participants, contestants in your game, are you able to interrogate them in some way to, to discern which is human and which is robot? And if you can't tell the difference in your interrogation of these two, which is which, then you have to say that the AI is intelligent, right? That's the, that's the Turing test. I happen to get today uh, a magazine, uh, AI magazine, comes about every quarter or so. This one's devoted to why the Turing test is too simple now. We need to toss it out the window and come up with more sophisticated Turing tests because it's way too easy to pass the old one. You find that startling? Why is it not startling that it's so easy to pass the Turing test? I mean, we're not passing robots out in the halls every day, so what are we missing? Why is it so easy to pass the Turing test? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's too easy to fake it. It's too easy to fake intelligence. How much of the time are we faking intelligence? <laughs> when you carry on just chit chat, are you really deeping, digging deep into the intellectual cognitive talent that you have or are you just faking it going through a script? Well, as you pointed out, it's all too often we're just all faking it. Let me give you some examples of questions that are proposed in the new and, advised, new and improved Turing tests of the future. Here's a good one. Which, which of the following examples describes an organism taking in nutrients? A, dog burying a bone. B, a girl eating an apple. C, an insect crawling on a leaf. Bo a D, a boy planting tomatoes in the garden. Fourth, here's another one. Fourth graders are planning a roller skate race. Which surface would be the best one for the race? Gravel, sand, blacktop, or grass? A student puts two identical plants in the same type, of, same type and amount of soil. She gives them the same amount of water she puts one of these plants near a sunny window and the other in a dark room. This experiment tests how the plants respond to light, air, water, soil. What do these questions all have in common? They're really simple, aren't they? They're really, really simple. These are what computers can't pass. So when we're thinking about 
passing the Turing test and uh, the Hollywood's depiction of AI, it's a long ways from where the field is right now. Except that the field has moved away from the idea of building general purpose robotic-like general intelligences and instead of that have specialized on idiot savants. Building systems that do one thing that requires intelligence, but that's all they're capable of. You ask them to do something slightly different from their one area of expertise, they fall on their face. What Hollywood likes, though, are these general intelligences that can do all the things human. And ones you should really be afraid of are the AI systems that are extraordinarily deep, like face recognition systems, autonomous vehicles, things that are going to have huge impacts on your life, but they're not robots the way that Hollywood portrays. Back to this issue of faking it, there was a famous line from 1978, an AI researcher named Roger Shank. He was asked back in 78, could you build, and he worked in natural language processing, so chatbots. Somebody asked him, could you build a system that's funny? Can you build an AI system that exhibits humor? And he said, you tell me the rules of humor and I'll write a program that's funny. Okay? And that's sort of what it all boils down to. It's, it's relatively easy to build any AI system if you can first tell me the rules for that intelligence. And that's the rub. Challenge is on you. It's not technology. Ready for another movie? Yes, that's right. You all know Watson, IBM Watson? Yeah. Passes the Jeopardy test, right? Blows us all away. It's my area of research, so I was like totally excited about that development. It's faking it. It's faking it. The reason that Watson does so well on Jeopardy is that Wikipedia is the perfect resource for doing well at Jeopardy. And it's easy within the state of the art, I mean. It's with, easy with respect to the state of the art to build a system that ingests all of Wikipedia. Ready for some more movies? OK, let's go. The robot in 2001 named HAL, which, by the way, is one letter off of IBM, and this robot are alike in the sense, or rather this AI, are alike in the sense that they're not humanoid. They exist in a box in the console of a ship. And that's a f good functional form for them. Again, no real need to be bipedal. It's just a disadvantage. Any other thoughts on this clip, on this movie? Right. 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 Yeah. Good point. This idea that there's a parameter for everything reminds me of a story I just want to recount quickly. 
I ride bikes, and I was riding my bike on uh, 54th, 54th Street, 51st Street, and, uh, and a car almost hits me. And I'm in a big wide bike lane, so this car had to really go, go out of its way to dig deep into the bike lane and swipe me. So I let the expletives hurl, as I normally do. And then I see on the back, Google autonomous vehicle. Okay, well, wasting my breath here. So I told this story to a friend of mine who works in autonomous vehicles. And he said, yeah, but it's just a simple parameter setting. So the Google engineers can just reset you know, distance from cyclist, one foot, three foot, what do you want? And that's the common response. And you heard it here in the movie as well. Don't like the humor setting? We'll just change that. Everything's a parameter. OK, next one. Hey, so, yeah. I have a suggestion for your return journey. Yes, sir. Have one last crack at the black hole. Alone, home, huh? Yeah, I know. This isn't going to cost you any time. There's a chance for people on Earth. Gargantua is an oldest spinning black hole. It's what we call a, a gentle singularity. Gentle? Better call it gentle. The tidal gravity is so quick that something crossing the horizon fast might survive. A protein. What happens after it crosses? After the horizon is a complete mystery. So, what's to say there isn't some way that the probe can glimpse the singularity and relay the quantum data? If he's equipped to transmit every form of energy that can pulse. Just when did this probe become a he, Professor? Tars is the obvious candidate. I've already told him what to look for. I need the old optical transmitter off Kip, Cooper. He did as far as Before you get all teary, try to remember that as a robot, I have to do anything you say. The key lines, brother. I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It was hard leaving everything. My kids, your father. We're going to be spending a lot of time together. We should learn to talk. Am I not to? Just being honest. I don't think you need to be that honest. <laughs> hey, Taurus, what's your honesty parameter? 90%. 90%. Absolute honesty isn't always the most diplomatic, nor the safest form of communication with emotional beings. Okay. 90% is this type of brand. <laughs> Any thoughts? Okay. Right, right. But remember, that's just a parameter setting. So if you want them to spend, to do the California roll through the stop sign, that's easily done. And it's all parameterized. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I think honesty itself is something very interesting in relation to yeah. uh, machines, because we expect machines to tell us the truth all the time. Even out of pre-medicine in relation to the medical field, we yeah. take all these tests and expect machines to tell us what the truth is. But oftentimes, even that truth has Right, right. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, uh, I have a point. I yeah, Roxanne.
intelligent but maybe not emotional, in incapable of feeling emotion? Does that make a difference to you, whether uh, you, uh, you expect it to always tell the truth? Yeah. So back to this uh, journal that is proposing a whole bunch of new Turing tests. It's broken into about, I would say, eight or ten chapters. And each chapter in here is about a different, measuring a different aspect of intelligence. For example, emotional intelligence is separate from the ability to think logically, the ability to reason about history, to reason about time. These are all reason about spatial properties. These are all different types of intelligence. We might get to choose which aspects of intelligence from that whole uh, smorgasbord, which ones do we want to put into our AIs? Do we want them to be emotionally intelligent? Let me give you an example from the emotion and intelligence test for robots proposed in this journal. You can then tell me whether you think this is something we want to have in our robots, or our, our AIs of the future, or not. Here it is. The social-emotional Turing challenge. Here's a question off the test. Situation. Sue and Mary notice that it's raining. Which of these is right? Sue feels happy because she expects the sun will come out tomorrow. Or B, Mary feels sad because she expects the sun will not, will, sorry, I said it wrong. Mary feels sad because she expects the sun will come out tomorrow. Do we want our AIs to be worried about whether they should be happy or sad under different situations like this? Or is that a part of intelligence we just as soon leave out? And if you do leave it out, does it make a difference to our sense for whether these systems deserve free will? Whether you'd feel bad if they're turned off? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're all going to be that at a time when you're born every day with a certain innate, some might say archetypes. Right. You see them in Slytherin, you know you're going to be afraid of it. You see a flower, right. you're not, you don't have that same sense of fear. Yeah. But they're machine and born, in a sense. Emotionless. Emotionless without these emotions yeah. or without this, I can say, sense that rain is sad and right. the sun is happy. Right. Then it's very hard to relate to them on a human sense. I see. So you think they'd be less useful to us? If they lack emo emotional response. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 So uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, at least of the near future, are going to need to be able to reason about two possible outcomes. They're being forced off the road. They either take out the cyclist on the right or by going the, veering the other direction, take out the four children on the sidewalk. And they have to reason through this situation. Does that require emotion? What does that require? Some kind of moral code. Yeah. Yes. The three laws of robots. That's right.
That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, Asimov's three laws of robots are robots have to always do what they're told by a human. Rule two, robots have to do whatever they need to to protect themselves, except when that action violates first rule. And rule three, robots have to What's the third rule? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, senior moment. Right. They can't hurt a human through, act, through their own action or inaction, except when that might be violated by rule two or one. So they would have to puzzle through this uh, situation of veering right or left. And presumably, if they're programmed the way that you and I might, or our culture, or what, our civilization? would program them, they'd take out the cyclists on the right. Everybody good with that? What do you think should happen? And of course, unplugging that one is relatively useless because of the, remember the replication property of AI systems. If there's one that's been useful, there's a billion of them. Yeah. Did it do the wrong thing? I see. Change the rules. Just write, change the program. Yeah. Right. So in this court of law, who's actually on trial? Is it the car or the car owner or the car coder, programmer, society? Oh, you're thinking that there could be a legislative body that could write all the rules. I think the legislative body would have as much trouble writing down that set of rules as my friend would have writing down the rules of humor. Point, Roxanne. Let's, uh, sorry, um, go ahead.
Right. Well, in our jurisprudence system, somebody's at fault. So if it's not the AI, it's you, the creator, or you, the civilization that embodies that set of rules. Roxanne, I want to make sure we see some things from her. So maybe um, uh, her number two. And I want to make sure we get to Stephen Hawking's. Please, your feelings are real. Oh, uh, this guy is talking to his personalized operating system. Okay, if you haven't seen the movie Her, that's what's that's what's going on. No, wait, what? Tell me. I want to know. Tell me. It's just that earlier I was thinking about how I was annoyed, and it's going to sound strange, but I was really excited about that. And then I was thinking about the other things I've been feeling, and I caught myself feeling proud of that, you know, proud of having my own feelings about the world. like. The times I was worried about you, things that hurt me, things I want. And then I had this terrible thought. Like, are these feelings even real? Or are they just programming? And that idea really hurts. And then I get angry at myself for even having pain. How many of you have seen this movie? If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. I went into a really, really pessimistic view. I, I worked on the first Siri system back in 04, 05, and this seemed like the height of cheesy, but it actually speaks to a lot of important issues. So if you haven't seen it, you should. Anybody have any thoughts about the movie? Yeah. It's free will. Mm -hmm. It started to exhibit free will. Yeah. And the idea that she's able to think about her thoughts. Yeah. It's metacognition, even though that's very right. human quality. That's right. Yeah. yeah, very good point. Yeah. Theory of mind, understanding what other people are thinking. But, uh, yeah. To what she said, too, um, humans uh, sometimes have desires that aren't desired by society, too, and, and kind of deal with um, the heavy view of the standard. So it's kind of saying that. There was a, sorry. There's a meta story going on in her that if you see the movie or see it again or reflect back on it, it's the loneliness of the protagonist and everybody in the whole society. All the humans are lonely. Every scene is people walking by themselves. They seem, and the occasions when, they, when two people talk, try to talk to one another, it never goes well. They can't communicate. They can't connect. And the only real connection that 
the protagonist has here is with Siri. Okay, let's, uh, let's get to uh, some of our uh, Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking's warnings. AI is much more advanced than people realize, and the pace of progress is much greater than people realize. You know, it'd be fairly obvious if you saw a robot walking around talking and behaving like a person, you're like, whoa, that's like, what, what's that? You know, that would be really obvious. What's not obvious is a huge server bank in a dark vault somewhere with an intelligence that's potentially vastly greater than what a human mind can do. I mean, its eyes and ears would be everywhere. Every, every camera, every microphone, every device that's network accessible. That's what it, really what AI means. It's not like a robot running around. The robots would simply be, they'll be like a figure of, of the AI. So you yourself have invested in some AI companies like DeepMind and Vicarious. Yeah. Why? I, I invested in those companies, even I know. I wanted to see how artificial intelligence was developing. If you're not careful about the advent of AI, it's possible that there could be what's called a, a, a bad utility function. Like the computer will do exactly what its goal is. Humanity's position on this planet depends on its intelligence. So if our intelligence uh, is exceeded, it's unlikely that we will remain in charge of the planet. Let's see Stephen Hawking's. Now, when you watch software engineers and machine learning experts at work, as, as they have been on this project, uh, how far along the path to artificial intelligence uh, do you think we are? The primitive forms of artificial intelligence we already have have proved very useful. But I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it will take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Humans, who are limited by slow biological evolution, could compete and would be superseded. Thank you for those fascinating insights. Let's say that we are worried about this technology. What could we do about it? Okay. So you're basically suggesting some kind of regulation that we put rules in place that say this kind of AI is okay, but you can't cross some line. You're crossing that line, you're risking the future of the human race, according to Stephen Hawking. So what would that line be? Autonomous vehicles good? And then where's the line? Okay. There will be punishments in place, right? But mm -hmm. I have this, as long as the choice is there, it doesn't matter what happens after. Mm -hmm. For a robot, if that choice is there, even if we decide to prosecute them in a court, mm -hmm. right, the damage has already been done. Mm -hmm. So we can't, if we don't want to risk that at all, then we can't ha let it make any choice it wants in the first place. Okay. Yes. So I would say free will is something a little more difficult to define. But that is, even there are some philosophers certainly that argue that human beings don't have free will, that everything that right. you are. It's just a program. It's just a program, just a reaction to the environment. That your decision at that point not to study would be a reaction to, for example, a party. And if that party didn't exist, then you wouldn't have made that decision. 
So if that's the case, then unless we are constantly dictating whatever every single decision that the right. robot makes, then you have to give an element what some might say is as much free will as a human being has. Good point. Right back there. That's right. So the HAL computer in 2001 didn't necessarily have free will, but it followed its own internal logic and concluded that the humans had to die to save the mission. The mission was more important. That's what uh, Elon Musk is referring to as a bad utility function, as you say, Alex. Good point. That's right. Right. You know, we can discuss it um, logically uh, without saying it's just there. Yeah. You know, everything, the table, the chair, the air, it has sensation. The arrangement of it is what dictates the quality. So our sense of consciousness just emerges from our physical presence in the world and it's our. It's there all the time. It's just there all the time. The particular quality of it is dependent on the arrangement somehow. And I'm not smart enough to come up with the rules for that, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think that matters in the free will discussion. In the right. Right. Then all you have to do is build the foundation of the machine in a particular way in order to get the desired effect. These are all really good points, but I can tell you as an engineer of AI systems that these points are not operational. I don't know where that line is. I don't know when I have to, if you pass a regulation that will preclude the kind of evil AIs that we see in Hollywood, and that we're maybe legitimately concerned about. I need better concrete guidance on what that line is, because right now I have no idea where to draw that line. We have regulation in other parts of society. Regulation around, for example, food additives. Regulation around cloning. Those are operational regulations. Or something that engineers can appreciate. I don't know how to come up with an operational line in the sand when it comes to AI. Any parting thoughts? Roxanne, I think our time is up. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we can, we can look at the one last clip. Of okay. The hey, I'll stay all night. <laughs> Merry Christmas.
Scott will be here to assist you momentarily. Stuart! No! Please remain stationary. A service spot will be here to assist you momentarily. Uh, Scott! Uh, no. Scott! The most dystopian view of all. Thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate your time.